We've all been in situations where we've had to have that difficult conversation, whether it's giving bad news, tackling poor performance, or just telling someone something that you know they're unlikely to be happy with. Whether you're a people pleaser or worried about the knock-on effect of what you say to others, if you don't get comfortable with tackling the challenging things, if you don't call out the things that need to be said, it can have a profound impact on you, your integrity, your reputation, and the trust that you're trying to build with your teams. The context, nature, and dynamics of the conversations you have will change the more senior you are in an organisation and not everyone is prepared for that. In this episode I'm talking to Louisa Clark, a difficult conversation specialist and founder of Confidently There which helps organisations to develop their verbal communications culture. We talk about the types of conversation leaders need to be having, how to be more self-aware and how to bring the human side into those challenging situations. Enjoy. So I'm delighted to welcome Louisa to this week's episode of Leaders with Impact. Thank you very much for agreeing to come on, Louisa. You are an expert in difficult and challenging conversations, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Well, thank you for having me on. It's really lovely to be here and I'm excited to get into this chat. I work with leaders, teams and sometimes whole organisations on how to have the difficult conversations more ethically, more effectively, more regularly. Yeah. How do we make ourselves feel okay? How, what is that self-management stuff that means it feels possible for us to lean in and air the stuff that can often feel challenging? Yeah. Yeah. So difficult conversations, I think, can be a really subjective topic because what's difficult for you might not be for me and vice yeah. versa. And that perception of difficulty can also be perhaps whether you're on the, the giving or the receiving end of a conversation. <laughs> so in the realms of the work that you do, how would you define a difficult conversation? I think that's exactly it. So I think for me, a difficult conversation is it's, it's to do with the response that we feel in our body, even mm. at the thought of needing to raise something. It's very often those topics that sometimes we don't even realize that we're putting them off, but we're definitely putting them off. It's from our own internal response generally that that's going to come up. Because sometimes, actually, of course, it's also difficult. You know, if let's say you're a leader or a manager and you need to have a really challenging performance management conversation with somebody within your team. And let's say it's a really complex situation because actually, on a social level, you get on really well with this person. You mm. really like them. They're lovely. They always remember your birthday. They always make a fuss. <laughs> they have a great time when you're out for a team dinner or drinks and you always really enjoy conversation with them. But then their performance has not been meeting the expectations that you've set and you know that you need to broach that with them. The thought of even doing that, you feel something happen to you internally at the prospect of needing to do it. That for me, there we are, that's a prime difficult conversation territory. And of course, it's also a difficult conversation for the person that's about to receive that information. Mm. So yeah, the work that I do tends to be the person that has to have it. It's about how do we hold ourselves accountable to stop avoiding and putting off or delaying or softening and slightly treading around the edges or for others, it's how do we have them in a way that doesn't involve getting our bolshie boots on and getting all up in someone's grill and getting mm. all kind of overly you know assertive is good yes aggressive tones of aggression never 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 and I think part of what took me into this work was realizing I feel really strongly we've only ever had it modeled to us or shown to us that difficult conversations happen in one of two ways that either they either just don't happen at all and we tread around the edges and there's a massive elephant in the room and nobody's saying the thing and then resentment builds up and build up the unsaid happens and frustration builds or we've seen people going in and we've had that whole, where well, you've got to be powerful. You've sometimes just got to name it. You've, you've got to kind of pull people into line. You've sometimes got to be a little bit assertive and aggressive and you've got to discipline. We've got to whip people into shape when things are going wrong. And I don't believe that is a, a good or sustainable or positive solution either. And the penny drop for me was when, through some of my background and training, I kind of hit upon this thing or there are the worlds of some of my training introduced me I suppose to what feels like the sweet spot between those two things mm. and I guess so much of my work is how do we name the thing that needs naming how do we make those difficult conversations as productive and effective as we possibly can do and as kind and as human as we possibly can I'm so over this old narrative that we've either got to be a boss bitch assertive aggressive mm -hmm. 
I get massive and quick results because people fall into line with me when actually all we're doing is inviting compliance through yeah. a bit of fear and shame. Yeah. Or, well, I'm really well liked, but yeah, I do let some expectations and standards slip here and there. I don't set boundaries particularly clearly. They just don't feel comfortable for me. And I would rather prize the quality of my relationship over having those expectations met. I'm done with the idea that it's a yeah. binary choice between yeah. those things. And the world of work I do is about, okay, well, what is that sweet spot between the two? Yeah, I, I love that. And there is so much there that I want us to get into in this conversation. But I want to take it right back to that first thing you said around it's your mm. own internal response. Mm. And I suppose, how how do you know when you're feeling those things in your body because I suppose you, what you're not trying to do is not have any feeling. So how do you know right. what's the right feeling and when to deal with that uncomfortableness and when it's feeling that actually you, you maybe need to be working on the internal feeling rather than the external action? I'm a massive advocate for developing a really clear sense of awareness and a mindfulness around what our own internal experience is at all mm. times. There's a massive part of this work that Again, it's part of what I love. So much of this work is super practical, but at the same time, there's a huge part of it to make it consistent and sustainable and properly become a part of our leadership style. There's a huge amount that is about our internal landscape mm. and our own self-management and around mindfulness and around mm. self-awareness and around through that cultivating our own sense of emotional intelligence. So I think it's about, yeah, our ability day to day and even sometimes moment to moment but to be pausing and tuning in I work with people frequently who don't even realize that they've been putting off a difficult conversation for I mean sometimes years yeah <laughs> I was about to say for weeks and I was thinking no it's not even that it's not even months sometimes years and what it has meant is that they've settled into some kind of process some kind of dynamic with people in their team that is really inefficient, ineffectual, and actually leaves a big old buildup of resentment and frustration on both sides normally. And it's like, let's clear the decks and here's how you can do that. So I think so often in, in that example where we haven't been having that difficult conversation, probably there has been some internal signal going on for some time that we've just been ignoring. We've not been tuning into it. We've been pushing past it. And there's a psychologist whose work I really like. And actually, she's probably been one of the most inspiring people I followed around the concepts of leadership and difficult conversations in leadership. And she's actually in the parenting space. She works in the space of how we navigate challenging conversations with our children. Mm. Her name's Dr. Becky Kennedy. She's huge on Instagram and she's got an amazing business and is an incredible leader in her own right within that business. But one of her mantras is that if we're feeling resentment, it's a sign that we didn't set a boundary early enough. And I love that as a concept. I find that so helpful. And linked to your question about, well, how do we recognize internally if there is some discomfort going on or if there is something happening within us around the prospect of a difficult conversation? Well, there's a really good start. And if you're coming away from a situation I don't know, let's say you have met with somebody within your team mm. and you know that they haven't been pulling their weight or there's something about their actions, their behaviors at work that are a little bit problematic. If you leave the meeting and actually the taste that's left in your mouth is a bit of resentment because perhaps you haven't quite held them accountable to be able to mm. know reliably they're going to move forward and fulfill whatever it is you need them to fulfill or to upskill in whatever area you need them to probably that's a sign that you are the one. It could only be a sign that you are the one that, that has a, a right, firstly, mm. and a responsibility to have that difficult conversation and name it. Yeah. So you've touched on this briefly, but I, I want to explore a little bit what that impact is if you shy away from having those types of conversations. If you've got that sense of resentment and you've talked about how that can build up for you and and the team, maybe the organisation, but there's bigger impacts, aren't there, when, when you leave those conversations unsaid? Yes, huge. So, I mean, at the milder end, it's stuff that we've kind of already been talking about where I think resentment can start to build, like just channels of communication between you just get a bit cloggy or a bit stale. Um, mm. It's hard to keep that free-flowing honesty and authenticity going between you. 
Because yes. I talk a lot with clients about buildup of the unsaid. Mm. And I really see it like this kind of thing that is mounding in the corner <laughs> that's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's amazing the lengths, as I say, that people will go to to not just actually bring it into the center and go, hey, let's look at this and let's work through it. So yeah, frustration and resentment and clogged channels of communication at one end of the spectrum. Mm. At the more severe end of the spectrum, I mean, it's toxic work cultures. It's it's power dynamics getting out of hand and being mm. allowed to run riots. It's really felt experience of hierarchy that doesn't feel good. It's what I would term really outdated and old styles of leadership that are not particularly human being allowed to rule the roost yeah. and continuing. It's also gossip culture. That's maybe sort of midway along the spectrum. But yeah, at the severe end, it's people leaving. And very often it's it's you struggling to retain the talent in your organization who actually are the ones that you really, really want to retain. They're the ones with high moral value. They're the ones who are highly ethical. They're the ones who are clear communicators. And if they just realize that they're working in a place where nobody is calling out the stuff that needs calling out, mm -hmm. broaching it in a way that really acknowledges fundamentally we are humans first and foremost and people who have a job and work second. Or perhaps they just are feeling frustrated that expectations and standards aren't even being set and therefore they're not being pushed to thrive and they want to, they're ambitious, they're driven. Yeah, that's often the pattern that I see is very often one of the main reasons organisations come to me is because they've got staff churn and they don't totally understand why. Yeah. And that for me is like prime, okay, nobody's having the difficult conversations and that's yeah. why. Yeah. And I think a lot of organisations strive for, for this sense of being high performing and, and having high performing teams, but you only get high performance if people feel like they can speak up and that culture of being able to speak up. If they feel like they are able to take collective risk with each other because there's that tr trust amongst yes. each other. Um, and you've mentioned the kind of power imbalance that can happen if people aren't speaking up. It also has that broader knock on if people are leaving that they're probably not given a great experience to whoever it is that they're serving. So whether that's your clients, customers or whatever or other staff. Yeah. It will affect organisational performance, financial performance and all of that kind of stuff. And it will ultimately affect an organisation's reputation. So these are kind of big impacts for what can feel like, oh, it's just a little conversation. A hundred percent. Yeah, I hadn't even touched yet on. But of course, productivity, of course, innovation, of course, streamlining of stuff, of course, creativity. All of these get hampered when power dynamics are running riot, when people don't feel they do have a voice or they don't feel that... Their leaders are genuinely openly available to them. All of the all of these things get kind of dampened. So yeah, it might not look like huge complaints and grievance procedures coming through HR. It might not look like a load of people leaving, but it really might look like just nothing running as as smoothly and not hitting that high performance sustainably in the way that you believe or would want your your workforce to be able to. Yeah. yeah. Where do you go if you're a leader and you're working in an organisation that perhaps has got that culture where people just don't feel comfortable having the conversations that need to be had? And I mean that not so much, obviously, it's one to one conversations, but in mm. senior leadership roles, they're not only looking at the one to one, they're looking at the collective. So how do you start to tackle that? Yeah, it's really difficult because, and, and it's, I'm sure this is something that it comes up in your world as well, Lee, a lot. I mean, culture change is slow. There's no, mm -hmm. there's no getting around it. It's really slow process. But I think where you go, and this is, we do project work sometimes with organizations because of exactly this issue. And the approach that we take to it comes from the world of restorative practice. And it's where we go in and we actually design and try to open up and invite every single person within a workforce to a group conversation. Mm. And that group conversation is of a size that is manageable for people to genuinely feel they can contribute. So we tend to not go over it about 15 at a time. But we then facilitate really specifically a restorative focused conversation that is specifically about how people are feeling. And this achieves a lot of things. It's it's a very structured process and a very structured and boundaried space mm. that has loads of kindness and no judgment and no shame and loads of heart. And sometimes, of course, that means doing quite a lot of work with the organization about the way that we are actually going to capture any data from that in a way that is totally ethical and makes people feel safe mm. to come in and actually speak. Because very often 
if they're getting us in in the first place, it's because people have not been speaking up at all, right? Yeah. But there's also something within it that is about sort of in the communication of the fact that we're going to start running a process like this and we're going to give everybody an opportunity to come and sit in a room and be held and led by a facilitator through a, a process that will make the, the space as safe as it possibly can do. There's also a thing that really invites responsibility in them. There's something mm. about the process that allows us to say, okay, here's the thing. We can see and understand and feel that things within our communication culture right now are not okay. They're not healthy. It's not going well. That must be having an impact on you. And we want to invite you into this space and we're going to make it as safe as we possibly can to. But if you have feelings about this, if you have a strength of feeling about the way that things are currently running, about your leadership, about yeah anything really at all to do with the way that your communication culture is functioning internally, if you've got a strength of feeling about that, this is the space to bring it to. And we're mm -hmm. asking you to please step in and let us know. Please choose that option rather than feeling frustrated and angry and going home and moaning in the pub to your mates about it every Friday night. Like, mm -hmm. Here's the space. Mm -hmm. When we know about it, we can do something about it. So it's about really cultivating what I would term a very adult to adult space, a really equitable, equal footing space where regardless of any kind of formal hierarchy, as in defined hierarchy within the organization, that actually you're just bringing people in as humans. Yeah. And we facilitate that conversation. We ask the really specific questions around the way that they are being impacted as a result of not feeling they can speak up. What do they need from here? We sometimes even give them choices. We lay out what we have a series of needs cards. This is a fairly standard exercise that a lot of sort of culture change people might do. But it's around getting people to say, do you know what? Yeah, as a collective, this, I don't know, group of five of us in this room at the moment, faced with these 36 human needs that we've got on cards, these five feel like the ones that right now we really need. And from there, then you get them to choose whittle that down to one even to focus mm. on. And then you do some work with them around, okay, well, that need then, what does that look like, sound like, and feel like once that has been achieved, once that need is being met? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's got to be, I think it's got to be an all staff approach. We've got to avoid offering, and I think this is where organizations often, in my eyes, are sometimes exacerbating the problem when they think they're trying to fix it. I think we've got to do anything that we can that avoids catering to the different levels and tiers of hierarchy and yeah. power dynamics. I think we've got to get everybody in a room and we've got to make it feel as equitable as we possibly can do. So you're mixing it up. You're not targeting this at, at different levels at different times. It is a blended approach across disciplines, across pay bands, etc. Yes. So definitely across disciplines. So I would really advise with a process like this that it, it's really not done in teams mm. because the teams probably have already chatted about this quite a lot amongst yeah. themselves anyway. And they're probably in a little bit of an echo chamber. And there's something so healthy about somebody from finance sitting there with somebody from whatever another team is within whatever organization we're imagining mm -hmm. this is from, but hearing what their experience has been. And it also just, again, it really invites that responsibility. We are in behave slightly differently when we're put in a, a space with people we don't know nearly as well than when we're in with our collective. The, the, the kind of standard dynamics of the way that that team exists can just translate and, and immediately be there in the room. And you might find, therefore, that the ones who always speak up, again, always speak up, the ones that don't speak up so much, they know their role within that collective is to not really speak up that much. Mm. So mixing up departments, yes. The one area of slight sensitivity around this, and we vary it depending on who we're working with and depending on the kind of feel within the organization at the time, is around whether you include execs mm. in those conversations or whether the presence of them is going to mean that people don't feel they can and very often that's the case so what we tend to do in that instance is the very top exec team don't partake with everybody else but we do then share back with them and we do also facilitate a conversation for them as well that's separate and I, I was going to ask I suppose what what that most senior leadership's responsibility is in in the process and I suppose mm. what is their role in in the contracting because I'm assuming that you might get situations where if, if the culture is that toxic, mm. that staff will still think, well, we don't feel listened to by the senior teams. We feed back all the time and we don't feel heard. Actually, I feel really scared what the outcome of me sharing my thoughts and feelings are, even yeah. if it's done anonymously. So there must be something that, that the leadership as, as a group need to do to take that responsibility and, and demonstrate as well. 
A hundred percent. I mean, I think, yeah, I think there are quite a few things within there. I mean, the first is that generally in committing to a project like this, mm. that is partly a signal in itself of senior leaders going, okay, we're willing to bring somebody else in and to hold this information and we're doing it because we want to know and we're ready to listen. Yeah. So I think there's some of that process that has kind of already gone on, hopefully by the time that we get there, but you're absolutely right that I've, I've done work with organizations where the, the lack of speak up culture was so embedded. Mm. The feeling of really extreme power dynamics and genuinely the vibe being, well, you don't put your head above the parapet. You just don't, you don't make yourself a target or there are going to be negative repercussions. Mm. And people literally saying to me, I've seen it. I've seen this happen. So no, I don't, you know, I don't speak up. And in those instances, what we'll often do is, yes, we're facilitating the group conversations and we invite everybody to come along, but we also offer a one-to-one -one and completely anonymous and confidential channel of communication mm. where essentially we end up almost being the go-between and we work with them. Anyone who's doing this as, as part of our organization is a restorative practitioner. So they know the questions to ask. We know the structure to follow that mm. really really does genuinely see and hear the challenge and we take as long as we need to with one-to-ones uh, via this we can meet off-site if it's in person or it happens online and then we work them through a process that helps to start put them in touch with their own agency I suppose around yeah. this very often yeah. when people are in that space they're at the point where it's like I just don't know what to do because I feel like I'm knocking my head against a brick wall we help them work through really validate and understand what's going on for them we help them see what their options might be. And it would never be about us then advising what they should do from there. It's about mm. them decide, stepping into their own choicefulness around it. But what it has allowed us to do on some projects in the past is we can then work with them to gather a sort of anonymized report statement, mm. version of events from their perspective that can then be shared with senior leaders. So I want to touch on some of the other barriers for people having or not having those difficult conversations. And one is that uh, people who might feel like they're on the spectrum of people pleaser, <laughs> <laughs> they don't like conflict and disruption. They they want to yeah. be liked, as you said earlier on in, in the discussion. But we know, again, if you're aiming for high performance, that you've got to have that sense of accountability and holding people to account um, in order to be managing them effectively, which means you've already alluded to that conversation around performance and the impact they might be having in the workplace. So how does someone start to deal and tame their people pleasing side if, if it's something that they are struggling with? Lee, I mean, this is my favourite part of the work that I do <laughs> as a recovering chronic people pleaser myself <laughs> these are my favorite people to work with and actually it's where my business started I discovered all of these strategies and tools around oh having a difficult conversation doesn't have to feel horrendous <laughs> and I don't have to have a personality transplant in order to do it and suddenly mm. be all bullshit and I was like ding 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 light bulb moments and when I started off yeah I want I was working with people really ambitious professionals who had their eyes on leadership or were wanting to step into leadership or had but weren't quite advancing in the way that they wanted to who really struggle with saying no with boundary setting with advocating for the stuff that they need with holding mm. other people to account because they yeah absolutely fall into that personality trait of being very people pleasing really liking pleasing others and there's yeah. nothing wrong with that no <laughs> so where do you begin yeah it's a really good question with them I actually do quite a lot of theory I, I use some psychological models and psychological frameworks and then some frameworks from some areas of social science but to, that all of which kind of are tools if you like for your toolbox that help you understand the dynamics that might be going on between people and therefore, why in those moments you might have such a strong desire to just say, yeah, sure, I can do that as well. <laughs> Knowing full well that when you've said that, you're going to have to work all weekend or whatever it might be. Mm. And what I do know through this work, and this is true of any sort of behavior change work, I suppose, is, of course, we cannot change anything until we've got awareness around it. Awareness has to be the first step. So learning some of those really tangible theoretical frameworks is so helpful in terms of propelling people from that feeling of just, I don't know why I do it to myself. <laughs> I just feel this overwhelming urge to make sure everyone thinks really well of me and likes me the whole time. And I run myself into the ground and I'm exhausted and I'm burning out. 
it it takes them from there to like, oh, how interesting. I can see what's going on in particular dynamics. Mm. From that awareness, then we start to look at some strategies around what would your choice be in that moment if we're able really kindly and with loads of self-compassion for ourselves because it's so often this is literally our nervous system is wired yeah. to meet other people's expectations. It feels fundamentally unsafe in our bodies when we first start doing this to displease other people. And so, yeah, it's about working them from that place into a position of choicefulness and being able to see those internal signals that are going on for what they are. Mm. The other big area of my background and work is transactional analysis. I'm on a very long and in-depth and very geeky journey mm. around all of this. But the fundamentals and, and, and the kind of basis of transactional analysis becomes very useful to us at this point. It's where we start to understand that internally within ourselves we carry so much stuff with us that is from childhood we carry so much stuff with us that are the lessons that we've learned from figures of authority mm. who we have been inspired by or who have taught us or who have been responsible for our care at various points and the messaging that they've given us and a huge part of that choicefulness piece then is about being able in the moment to see oh okay historically yeah i can see that by always pleasing by always being incredibly reliable by always really making sure that everybody else's expectations are being met and mine going to the bottom of the pile that is how i've really felt safe and it's how i felt most seen and it's mm. how i felt most connected to and i can see all of that and that it no longer exists now in my adult here in the present i don't have to continue to follow down that path the default path is not laid out for me it's there and I could take it, mm. but there is this other choice over here that is about allowing me in the moment to see that really, really strong need to say yes to this thing that I know I do not have capacity for. I'm just noticing you. Thank you. I know exactly what you're doing. You're trying to help me keep feeling safe and you're really familiar and this pattern feels really familiar and lovely. And I'm just going to hold you there because I want to start making a different choice. Mm. And then from there, we look at some, and again, this then is sort of from restorative work, but we look at literal step-by-step -step ways to word things, way, ways to phrase things that allows you to say the difficult thing, set the boundary, have the conversation with someone in your team who's always late or whose performance has not been up to scratch and how you do it in a way that is really adult. It's really emotionally responsible. It doesn't shy away from the thing that we need, but it has real heart and humanity. And, and suddenly knowing that we could word things from that space for those of us who do people please, well, it's suddenly a much easier route to take than if the only alternative was, well, no, you've got to really lay into them and teach them a lesson, you know? Yeah. That's so never going to feel okay in our bodies. It sounds like, quite rightfully, there's a lot of work you need to do with yourself and having a difficult conversation with yourself first and foremost yes. and it's not about which I think often people might think it's about I just need to get over it or because you can't just get yeah. over it you can't just change your personality overnight because you're always just going to naturally revert back into what feels comfortable yeah, completely. And I think I think you're so right. That is such a, just socially we say that, don't we? Just like, oh, I've just got to pull myself together. I've just got to get over it. And actually, I believe that when we are slightly berating ourselves, punishing ourselves with that, we might actually be slightly exacerbating the problem. Mm -hmm. I'm a really big believer that what we resist internally within ourselves tends to persist and possibly mm -hmm. therefore get stronger. Mm -hmm. And when we're saying to ourselves, essentially, oh, this feels really uncomfortable, I'm going to have to call out this thing, this feels horrible, oh, I should need to pull myself together and get over it. We don't realize, but we're slightly feeding the feeling because we're yeah. resisting it and it tends to take a hold and get stronger. What we're far better doing in that moment is to just pause and recognize what is happening for us without judgment, if we can. That's mm. the thing that comes along is we really judge it and we mm. berate ourselves. It's like, oh, if I was really a strong leader... I wouldn't have an issue having these conversations if I was really meant for this role. And this is where imposter syndrome so mm. often starts to rear its ugly head as well, right? But instead, it's about catching that narrative if we can, seeing what is happening inside of us. Oh, yeah, I can feel, I can feel this feels really uncomfortable and awkward and horrible. I feel a little bit like I want to be sick. I do not want to have to raise this. It feels deeply uncomfortable. The second we recognize it, it allows us to actually validate why it's there. Of course I do. Of course this feels horrible and difficult. I don't like upsetting people. 
I'm worried that they're going to be upset as a result of this. That's totally human and normal, especially if I'm a bit of a people pleaser, right? Yeah. And then finally, we can allow that feeling to be there. It's a, I'm allowed to find this difficult. I'm allowed to find this a bit uncomfortable. And I can go in and have this conversation. And it might sound like a, a flippant bit of self-talk. That couldn't be further from the truth. Mm. It suddenly just rewires us away from resisting that strength of feeling and it allows it in. And two things happen. One, it takes the real sting out of the feeling anyway in noticing it and just letting it be there. Actually, we feel a kind of reduction in it. It takes the sting out of it. But secondly, the other thing is that really that's how we access the root of our self confidence. Confidence mm. is not about heading into a situation and feeling bulletproof and always feeling great. Confidence actually is about our ability to just be at home with whatever we're feeling in any given moment. And I've nabbed that completely again from Dr. Becky Kennedy, but it's <laughs> so true. It's wonderful. It's this idea. Confidence is about just being able to be at home with whatever it is that's going on for us. Mm. It was, we can lean in. It's, it's another perception thing, isn't it? It's like completely. the term, what is difficult conversation? What is confidence? It means so many different things to different people. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I completely agree. Completely. My background is working in the NHS and mm. I notice that people, particularly clinicians, they get trained to have difficult conversations, one-on-one -on -one conversations with people and life-changing conversations with mm. people. But then they move up into um, a more senior management route, a broader organisational role. And I suppose the context and the dynamics of the types of conversations they have change but they don't know how to bridge that gap from I'm great at having those one-to-one -one conversations in my area of expertise but how do I deal with those different um, scenarios so it might be board meetings and and challenges of a board it might be going out to the public and having town hall discussions where the public are throwing difficult questions at them media interviews dealing with different stakeholders like MPs or mm. external mm. influences and stuff and vexatious complainants all of these things you perhaps aren't prepared for what might you need to adapt in your approach as you move into a more senior leadership role and, and you move away from the team one-to-one -one dynamics you might have or whether that's one-to-one -one client relationships or whatever it might be how do you start to identify where your areas of development and, and work might need to be so ironically, I would say probably the reason that those earlier difficult conversations, which actually arguably are kind of more life altering mm. immediately in the moment, life altering, you know, the, the thought of having to let a family know that, I don't know, that a, a beloved family member's cancer is now terminal or mm. that an urgent operation does need to happen, needs to happen right now. And, you know the high risk, the stakes, the necessary humanity in having those conversations. Ironically, I think probably what goes on for people as they move up and they have to have then those more maybe publicly mm. challenging or scary, difficult conversations, the world would tell you or society kind of tells us that there isn't much space for humanity in a board meeting. <laughs> right yeah. there isn't much space for humanity you've just got to be right and you've got to back yourself and you've got to be solid on your facts and you've got to be unwavering in your confidence in it all and you've got to do that when you're in the town hall meeting or when you're facing the press or when you're I would completely contradict that mm. concept and what I would actually suggest is that as people move up and they are faced with these more public and higher stakes conversations that actually there is the time to really key into and take with you the humanity that they must have had. And I, I would imagine to even be in that sort of job role. I can think back to times when we've had family illness or and, and been in hospital and had, some, had to be on the receiving end of some of those difficult conversations. And there was one consultant in particular who was just incredible. Incredible. There was also one other who was much less yeah. incredible. <laughs> and what was the difference between the two of them? Humanity. Yeah. It was humanity and curiosity, genuine curiosity for how we were and how things were landing. Neither of them shied away from saying the difficult thing. It's just that the one who didn't handle it nearly as well didn't shy away from the difficult thing, and but didn't pair it with that necessary warmth and curiosity for how this was landing with us. Mm -hmm. The other 
consultant that I can think of was she was incredible and it was so clear and there was no fluff or waffle there was no treading around on eggshells around the outside but there was just such desire for connection with us and humanity and however we were was okay Mm. that humanity I think is actually what we need more of as we head higher why do we avoid it one because I think the world teaches us we shouldn't. We've had this narrative the whole time that powerful leadership means being infallible and being always on your game mm. and being perfect as we head out there and are faced by challenge and faced by other people that we just back ourselves and we know inherently that we're right and we persuade everybody else. What I would so much rather see is a desire to absolutely stand firm by what we currently believe and what we are wanting to advocate for and what feels important and necessary to share, even when it's crunchy and difficult. And to pair that the whole time with a desire to connect rather Mm. than a desire to prove that we're right. Mm -hmm. I love that sense of curiosity because that is absolutely the foundation of having a great conversation, regardless of whether it's a difficult one or or a positive one the curiosity is king isn't it (laughs) completely completely it really is and and also I have real empathy and understanding for I mean as you were saying about having to go into town halls and deal with people because you're having to deliver I don't know a policy change or you're having to face the media about something terrible has happened of course it's so difficult in those moments to back yourself and have that ounce of openness open-heartedness and curiosity because it's so vulnerable. We feel vulnerable to be able to do that. But to be able to stand there in those moments and say, okay, I want to firstly name, and this is a big thing I coach clients to do, is name the fact it's difficult. Let's connect over the fact this is uncomfortable. I want to name today what I've got to share feels uncomfortable and it feels difficult and that we're not all going to agree. And I need to let you know X, Y, or Z. But to lead that conversation from that position of here's what I and we currently believe and here are the difficult decisions that we are having to make. And please know we are not completely close-minded here. I am open to the fact that we may learn something that will change our view or change our opinion. I'm also open to the fact that we may learn something that won't change it at all, but I'm open. Yeah, That's the humanity that I would want to see carried through. I wrote down the word before you said it. It was the same word I was thinking, which is vulnerability. I think that's something that those in senior leadership roles can be very scared of showing, but absolutely is the thing that helps you connect most with the people around you. So um, it's that weird catch 22, isn't it? Completely. And naming that, acknowledging the fact that you do feel vulnerable or scared or that the fact you're about to have a difficult conversation and saying to that person, look, I know this is going to be difficult. (laughs) But. Completely. Yeah, completely. I've got, I talk a lot about just name the elephant that's in the room. And this has become such a thing. I've now got little elephants all over my branding everywhere. And this <laughs> is why. <laughs> it's also just, it's a really cute little graphic yeah. and I ran wild with it. But I would use that in any instance, actually. It's the same if you are a leader and you are having a challenging conversation with another staff member and you can feel that, you know, I suspect we all kind of know these. I'm thinking immediately of somebody I've been doing some work with recently, but who, the the person they are trying to hold accountable just always seems to avoid. They just mm, always seem mm. to have another excuse. They just always seem to, yes, but, yes, but, yes, but is the game essentially that they're playing with you. And rather than getting stuck in a kind of power struggle around that, my advice would always be to step out of the game by, with loads of kindness and loads of compassion, name the dynamic that's going on. Hey, I just want to pause the conversation we're on because I'm, I'm noticing that anything at all that is suggested here I feel as though immediately the decision has already been made that it's not going to be suitable and I'm curious about what's going on there I'd really really love to understand what's happening cut through it let's name the thing that's happening we know it we can feel it so often we can feel this isn't going to go anywhere (laughs) because this person is so resistant or slithering around and quite difficult to pin down with loads of kindness and with no shaming or blaming that's crucial yeah but with kindness and compassion, let's name it. Let's not yeah. shy away. Name yeah, the other I think that's room. really helpful and, and a practical example someone can take into their next conversation, isn't it? And yeah. we've talked a lot about people 
delivering difficult conversations. But of course, leaders can be on the, the receiving end of difficult conversations. And I think that can be just as hard how you respond or don't respond to something yeah. can set the tone and precedent for all those types of conversations. So what do you do in the context of where you might be surprised, you might not be prepared, but you know you need to respond in some way? How, how do you handle it? So again, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but there's a huge amount of this that is about self-management. Yeah. And there's a fundamental truth that I use a lot in my work and talk to clients about actually whatever whatever level, this is just a human truth for me, right? Mm -hmm. which is that we are always responsible for our own emotional regulation, always. And the lovely flip side of that is we are never responsible for somebody else's. Now, people always freak out a bit about that second part because they're like, oh, but I do worry about how other people feel. I do Mm. want to be, and they confuse it with empathy. Empathy is glorious, a fundamental asset, I would say, for any good leader, anywhere, any good human, actually. (laughs) So I'm not suggesting for a second that that goes anywhere, but I am just reframing slightly what I believe it is. I don't believe for a second. Empathy is not, for me, worrying about the way somebody else is going to feel and feeling their feelings on their behalf. Instead, empathy is about being really clear in our minds about these are my feelings and therefore they are my responsibility. They are yours and I can see and hear them and connect to you about them. I can imagine what it would be like. And Wow, that sounds rough. That sounds really difficult. But that's different than us getting wrapped up in their feelings for them. The irony being that so often it's hugely, hugely empathetic people that struggle the most to have the difficult conversations because they are so worried about how it's going to feel in their body when the person that they're saying something difficult to has an emotional response. That's not empathy at all that's going on there. Psychologists or psychotherapists would call it something called codependency, which is where we actually, feelings feel contagious and we get so confused about what exists in our body and what exists in others. And again, it comes from a really lovely place. It's probably because at some stage we've been hardwired to adapt the way that we're behaving to make sure we're pleasing other people, right? Yeah. But in our adults, and this is a crucial tool that I think leaders need to get a hold of, is the ability to recognize, hang on, these feelings exist in my body. Theirs exist in theirs. You can imagine a sheet of glass even existing between you where you can see and hear them through it but their feelings do not come through the glass. They Mm. have a right to feel however they need to feel. They also have a responsibility to regulate themselves around it. So to go back to your question, of course, that can mean if we are on the receiving end of something that shocks us or that surprises us or that it kind of dysregulates us in whatever way, it's about taking a breath and remembering that two things are true. This is our responsibility to manage and it's okay that it's difficult. Mm. And within that space, even when there is hierarchy at play, so let's say you are a senior leader and this is your CEO pulling you in for a conversation, I would still advocate the more that we can head into those spaces and recognize that, yes, a kind of um, literal hierarchy exists between us in terms of the way the company is set up. Fundamentally, we are two human beings. We are two adults sitting down to have this conversation. And therefore, if whatever it is that you are spoken to about, the difficult conversation you're on the receiving end of, if that dysregulates you to the point you need a bit of space, that you ask for it. Hmm. You say, thank you for letting me know that. I'm finding that quite hard to process or that's hit me quite hard. I'm, I'm gonna, I'd really like to just take five minutes to regulate myself, ground myself so that I can come back and we can have this conversation productively. What won't happen is the conversation will not be productive if we are really emotionally triggered and Mm. struggling to find Mm. our groundedness through it again. Of course, in good leadership, what you'd hope is that the CEO actually has handled it with such humanity and warmth and contracting and and clarity and boundaries around it that you're never blindsided. That, okay, it might be hard to hear, but you're also met with the nurture and support and care that is required to have you then move on and meet the new and higher expectations of whatever that is. That's what you'd hope, but of course it doesn't happen in every instance. But sometimes just rooting yourself in the only person whose feelings I'm responsible for actually is mine. 
Yeah. And then trusting, because people always then say to me, oh, doesn't that mean that I might, if I don't think at all about the way other people are feeling, that I might do something that's really unkind or unfair? And I think, no, you won't. You won't, because if we're human beings who on the whole have a desire for connection and trust your own sense of integrity. Yeah. Trust your own sense of integrity and let the rest go yeah. and work with yourself. Yeah. yeah. You, your values still run through the way you lead, regardless of, of how... And I really, I really connected with the point you made around empathy. And it's something that I've talked about a lot. Actually, leaders, it's more about showing compassion, because if you try and take on other people's emotions, you're, you, you then become the fixer or you, or you avoid the things that you're trying to tackle. So it is about more leaning into compassion than trying to be, be empathetic, I would say. I love that distinction. Yeah, I love it completely. And this is a lot. I mean, we're getting into sort of Brene Brown's yeah. world and work, aren't we? Which <laughs> I love her. But absolutely, that distinction is so, it's so important. And it is about us just shifting out of this notion that actually to be empathetic, we have to feel on behalf of somebody else. No, not yeah. at all. We need to be able to see it and hold it, yeah. hold it and hold them in the space. Yeah. So my final question is, What's the one piece of advice about difficult or challenging conversations that you would give to leaders? The, the one thing that you wish they'd pay more attention to? Yeah, I think the core thing is, I mean, I've got so many, but I'm going to try and whittle it down to one. The core thing is to just give yourself permission the whole time to remember that difficult conversations get to tick two boxes at once. They get to be productive and kind. Productive and kind. And when you're planning to have to raise anything at all, that is a very, very simple, quick little tick box in your mind to think, right, the thing that I'm about to say to this colleague, this team member, whoever it is, is the thing that I'm about to say both productive and kind. And it needs to tick both of those boxes. As long as it does you probably can't go far wrong. Mm. And for me, being able to lean in and access that kind of resource in the moment is about, and I'm looping way back to what I was saying earlier, but it's about really calling time on this notion that to have the difficult conversation, we either are going to risk the relationship and not be as well connected afterwards, mm. or we are going to avoid saying the thing. And just tread a bit gently and just take, and it's just easier to take more on ourselves and not really hold them to account. Yeah. Let's just call time on this notion that it's, it's an either or choice between being bullshit or being too nice. Yeah. It really isn't. And I love the thought within all of that. I distinguish a lot. I talk about kindness so much in my work, but I don't talk about niceness because for me, they're two very, very different mm. things. Mm. Nice is so worried about being liked and worrying about being liked is a challenge that is always going to hold you back. Yeah. You can absolutely worry about quality human connections. You can worry about the quality and integrity of relationships. But if we're too attached to being liked, we're going to stay in the nice camp rather than the kind. Kind yeah. allows us to say the difficult thing, but yeah. with compassion, with warmth. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I'm I'm totally signed up for that manifesto. <laughs> yes. Let's do it, Lee. We're changing yes. the world. Yes. So thank you so much for your time. If people want to follow you online or get in touch or just to say thank you because they've learned something new from this conversation, how do they find you? Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so I'm on, I'm probably most active on LinkedIn and I'm Louisa Clark. You can find me under my name. But if you're interested, you can have a look at my website, which is www.confidentlythere.com. And I do have on there a freebie download, which is a checklist of five steps to take before you have the difficult conversation. I'll put all those links in the show notes as well. And I will be downloading that myself, I think, later Amazing. this afternoon. <laughs> right. Well, thank you again. I really appreciate your time. And I've learned loads in that conversation. Thank you so much for having me on. I have uh, loved it. I could talk to you all daily. Thank you. <laughs> if you enjoyed this episode, please let me know on Apple Podcasts or on the app of choice. And drop me a line over on LinkedIn. You can find me at Lee Griffith. I'll be back with the next episode in two weeks' time. So in the meantime, remember to sign up to my newsletter at sundayskies.com to get notified of new episodes, guest appearances, and further insights on how to lead with impact. Until next time.